Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, exciting Central. Can we give God praise this morning? Can we clap our hands and shout out to God with the voice of triumph? This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for giving us another day. It's another day that his mercies are new for us. It's another day that he's given us grace and strength and staying power that we need to live in this world. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you. We love you, Lord, for your grace that is more than sufficient, is more than enough for us. God, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you have made. God, we thank you for allowing us to come into this building to give your name praise. We ask that your presence saturates this place. Go up and down each and every aisle, through eight, every row. God, we thank you, Lord, that your presence is filled in this place. We will not be the same the, the same way that we came. We declare, God, that every life that opens, that comes through this door, will be changed for the better forever. We give you praise for what you're going to do in this house. Let your spirit fall. We declare freedom in this place. We declare victory in this place. We declare healing in this place. We declare prosperity in this place. And we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. And when it's in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody shout amen. Hallelujah. Can we give God our best praise this morning? This hallelujah. We give God praise. We love on our God this morning. Come on and cut those hands. Let's get ready to love our God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm ready. Here we go. Let's go. Say, as we love on you, receive our love. Receive our love. Oh, and as we shout in your name, receive our praise. We love, say, as we love, as we love, oh, yeah. Yeah. receive our love, receive our love, receive our love. Come on, we want to love on our God as we shout your name.
heard that there's no love greater than greater than his so we love on the lord this morning how many people really love jesus this morning we're going to make that declaration this morning it simply says jesus i love you i love this song because it speaks directly to our father we get to love on our god and simply say jesus i love you can we echo that jesus i love you can you lift up your voice and shout out to god this morning hallelujah Words can describe the feeling I have down inside. It is hard to contain. So I'll simply say. So I'll simply say, Jesus. Can you lift your voice? Say. of our God this morning. We love you, Jesus. We adore you, Lord. We magnify your name. Hallelujah. We're going to go back to the top, and we're going to sing it all together. Here we go. Say millions of words. Say millions. Millions of words can describe the feeling I have inside. The feeling I have down inside. It's hard to contain, so I'll simply say. So I'll simply say, Jesus. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love, I love 
Bless our God. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We adore you, Jesus. There's nothing like you. Come on. Don't get tired. There's nothing like you, God. You reign in all the earth, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, there's no other love that's like His. Come on, can we say Jesus? Say Jesus. says Jesus I love you there's nothing more intimate that you could give Jesus than saying Jesus I love you there's nothing more intimate that you could give him than saying Jesus I love you I adore you Lord for all that you've done for me Lord for the grace you've given for the mercy you've shown some of us need to look back over our life over this past week and recognize that if it had not been for the Lord we wouldn't be standing here today but it's because of his sufficient grace. Somebody say sufficient grace that he has brought us here today. It's his everlasting mercy that has kept us in our right minds. It's his everlasting love that has kept us in his hand. Do I have any witnesses in here that can testify of the love of Jesus? Yes. Whoa. That in three parts, say, I love, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Can y'all say that with us? Say, I love, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. Come on, let your voice sing it out loud. Say, I love, I love you. Come on, sing it. I love you. Because you, God. I love you. There's none like you, God. I love you. One more time, let this place say, I love you. this morning say Lord
my mind, my soul belongs to you. Y'all know it? You gave your life for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Say I love you. This last one, I promise. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you, because you care for me in such a special way. That's why, that's why I, I lift you up and magnify you. Let's say, let's go home. Say, that's why, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Now if your heart is filled with praise, lift up this place. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Oh, he lived you up this morning. Hallelujah. It's an amazing opportunity that we have to love on Jesus. We give God all the honor and all the glory. We give him all the praise this morning. We just took this time out just to let God know if he didn't do it. It doesn't matter if he gives us the wants and desires of our hearts today or tomorrow. We're still going to love him. That's what we're saying, God. We love you more than life itself because you're so good, because, simply because you're God. There's no other God that we can declare our salvation by. So we love Jesus. We love Jesus, right? We love God because he first loved us. Hallelujah. Can we give God praise? One more praise. Of, come on, a victory. Hallelujah. You may go ahead and take your seats this morning. We give God all the honor and give God. I can stay there all day long. I love you. <laughs> One more time, I love. I love you. I said I can do it. I love you. All right, stop playing. I love. I love you. I love you. All right. All right, we're done. Hallelujah. We give God praise. We just want to love on the Lord. Hallelujah. Is that all right? Yeah. All right, all right. All right, we give God all of the honor and all the glory for all of the good things that he's done. So do we have any first-time visitors? We want to welcome you into the house of glory. Anybody that's visiting us for the very first time this morning? Anybody? Well, do we have anybody online that's visiting with us for the very first time? I want you to type something in the chat. Let us know that you're with us for the very first time. Hit something in that comments. Hit like first time visitor or I'm with you for uh, anything. Most of all, hit that like, hit that share, hit that, uh, that heart button. Let us know and let other people know what God is doing here at Exciting Central for us and through us this morning. Do we have any maybe not first time visitors, maybe second, third or fourth time visiting with us it looks like i have all family with us this morning hey no we got some more hey good morning good morning we want to thank you so much for joining us in our worship experience this morning listen our worship has been so much sweeter that your presence has joined us and we just give god praise for your presence this morning and we want to welcome you into the house of the lord welcome to exciting central where you're not just wanted welcome but you're also wanted amen can we give god praise for our visitors here All right. Well, that was all right. Can we give God praise for our visitors? We want to make them feel. There you go. Hallelujah. We said that we're one. We want them here. We want them to come back, right? In Jesus' name. Yeah. We want them to feel the love of Jesus, that same love that we gave him. We want to shower down on each other this morning. Amen. All right. Well, we want to go ahead and get our offering. Uh, so let's uh, we've given our love to Jesus. We've poured out our hearts in adoration. Now let's give a tangible gift unto the Lord because it's better to give always than it is to receive. Some people who are young may not understand that because even when I was young, I never really understood that concept. But David said, I once was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, Amen. nor his seed begging bread. And I understood that because, like, God has never failed. He has never left my side. Amen. So it doesn't matter what I, like, it doesn't matter how blessed I am. I can never repay him 
for his goodness and for his grace. Right. But because he blesses me, I have no problem giving back to him. So we want to show that same spirit. We want to give in that same spirit of gratitude and thankfulness this morning. So let's go ahead and get our offerings ready. For those who are joining us online, you will see a uh, 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 video prior to our announcements on how to give virtually. For those who are in the house, you may, excuse me, you may come up and give through the receptacles here, or you can also give virtually, whatever is your choice. But you do have those options to give to the Lord this morning. All right, can we give to the Lord with cheerful hearts? Because the Lord loves cheerful givers, right? And we are cheerful givers. We are going to give with cheerful hearts this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Give to you, Lord, this morning. Let's look to the Lord and let's give, let's look to the Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that every good and perfect gift, Lord, it comes from you. All things come of the old Lord, and it's of your own that we are giving back to you, Lord. We can never repay for your good for your goodness and your kindness. The provision that you've made for us. God, we thank you so much for your hedge of protection that has been around us, God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all of the things that you have done for us. So it's out of that same heart of thankfulness that we are giving back to you, Lord. We ask that you bless the seed, bless the hands that are giving this morning. God, we ask that those who may want to give but may not have to give, Lord, we pray a special blessing on their household even now. God, we thank you, Lord, that every need is met today. We thank you, Lord, that every need is supplied. Even every want and desire is given today, Lord, because you are a good, good father, and you love us, and we love you back. God, we thank you now. We bless the seed and we bless this offering. We ask that we uh, that you continue to do great works through us and for us. And it's in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. To the screen. Remember. God loves cheerful givers, and you can give by four methods. One, go to centraltampa.org and click the Give Online link. Two, by texting Exciting Central with no spaces to 73256. Three, by opening the ECTBC app and clicking the Give link at the bottom. Or by mailing any contributions to our physical address at 2923 North Tampa Street, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Remember, honor the Lord by giving Him the first part of your income and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Thank you and God bless. Welcome to the exciting Central News Network. Tennessee Valley Ministry Institute. Love, honor, faith, compassion, and humility. These words may describe you. Have you or someone you know been called into the ministry of counseling? If so, here's your chance to become professionally equipped in one day through Tennessee Valley's Ministry Institute's all-inclusive certified training program. Training will be held on-site at Central on Saturday, October 30th. Cost is $199. For the registration link and more details, visit centraltampa.org. Church Picnic. Save the date for our church picnic on Saturday, October 23rd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Invite your family and friends to join us for games, fellowship, and fun. There'll be activities for all ages, including an obstacle course, volleyball, basketball, board games, a cakewalk, and so much more. I can't wait to be there. Meet me there. Better yet, beat me there. Oh yeah, I'll beat you there. And for more details, let us know if you'll be there by RSVPing on Realm. 
food distribution date change. Due to the church picnic next Saturday, the food distribution normally held on Saturdays will be rescheduled to Sunday, October 24th at 12 p.m. For more information, contact the church office. Outdoor Church Service. Central, it's time to head outdoors again. Join us on Sunday, October 31st at 9.30 a.m. for a great time of worship on the church lawn. As always, social distancing should be observed. Tech Team Ministry Openings. Would you like to learn new skills while helping to support our worship services and events? The Tech Team is looking for middle and high school students as well as adult volunteers to assist with our audio and video productions. No experience is required to be part of this fun, dynamic ministry. Training will be provided. For more details, please email techteam at centraltampa.org or contact the church office. And those are today's announcements. Remember, you can replay this announcement at any time via our central app. You can download the app from our website or search for Exciting Central Tampa Baptist in the App Store or Play Store. Good morning, church. As you know, this month is Pastor Appreciation Month. And we... Absolutely. On behalf of Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church and on behalf of the Deacon Council, we would like to present Pastors of Moore with a small token of our appreciation. And I ask him to come up. Wait, 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 wait. Why don't you open up your gift and see what you got? Can we give our esteemed 
awesome pastor another round of applause we want to let him know how much we love him If I was your pastor, I would not be all right with that. So I'm going to start over again. Can we give our amazing, awesome, esteemed pastor, Lennox Zamora, a round of applause? We want to let him know that we love him. We appreciate all that he's done. I have not seen a man who has a heart for the people so much as he does. Just want to let you know that we appreciate and we love you. And we give God praise for you. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. There we go. Can we continue loving on our God this morning? I got one more. I said, can we continue loving on our God this morning? We got one more song. I'm going to need you to clap your hands, get on your feet, and just probably dance with us, with us this morning. Hallelujah. All right. One, two, there we go. Let's go. Song says, I just really want to tell you how much I love you. Hallelujah. Say this, say Oh, oh, oh sing oh, 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 One more time Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 Come on, I can't hear you, put those hands Alright, here we go I love this song Say, I am her son you are my father. Oh, how you love to love me. Oh, you are my source. There is none other. There is none other. Oh, how, oh, how you love to love me. My life is in your hands. You give me love. Another chance. Just to 
Give me a church to drive. Give me some stuff. Give me some stuff with that. Let's go to church on it. what a Lord is for. Thank you. That's what a king is for. A king's job, as a matter of fact, when you come into the presence of a king, if you had a sulky expression on your face, it could mean you could lose your life because you are suggesting to the king that you are not happy with his provisions. That's why it says when you come into the presence of the Lord, you come with what? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with Yes, that's right. We praise, we praise because we are saying, I'm satisfied. We are saying, Lord, you've been good to me. Uh, you've been mighty, 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 mighty good to me. I don't know about you, but God has been really good to me. I, I don't have, if there was a department to register complaint, they would go out of business because there is no complaint to register. I'm so satisfied. And when I hear people like my dear sister Francesca at the front who just had a funeral for her son yesterday and today she's standing up and she's saying you're my everything still my everything <clears throat> the Hebrew boy said though he slay me yet will I serve him someone said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away still Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because we know that all things will work together for good. No matter what befalls you now, it's going to be okay. Those of you online looking at us, it's going to be okay. Do not let your faith vacillate, equivocate, or waver in any way. You remain steadfast on the word of God no matter what happens around you. 10,000 could fall at your right hand and on your left hand you stand up because you shall not be moved at the end it's always going to be okay hallelujah thank you so much for the surprise it was it was uh, it is most appreciated thank you so much thank you so much uh, 
I've always wanted one of those, by the way. <laughs> so somebody, somebody, somebody is perceptive. Uh, and we appreciate it. Coming from the entire church. For all of you who fasted, all of you who fasted, all of you who obeyed the voice of the man of God and you fasted, we appreciate it deeply. And we believe the answer is already here. It's on its way. And for those of you who stayed up all night last Monday from 6 in the afternoon to 6 in the morning, pray nonstop. That was a challenge. But oh, wasn't it beautiful? I, I mean, it was, it was lovely. It is one of those things that only few people get to reminisce about. <clears throat> you got to try it sometime. Stand with me if you would one more time. Grab your Bible. If it's your phone, grab your phone. That's fine to your iPad. My spirit is God breathed. God's word is God breathed. Therefore, God's word gives me life. I am ready to hear it. I am ready to heed it. And I'm ready to be transformed. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. If everyone won one, and the one won one one, what a great multitude would be won when everyone won had won one. We've been preaching on how Jesus won his one, <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about one more person, someone called Andrew. We fasted on Monday all night, and all night fasting and prayer, not fasted but prayer, on Monday, but for Jesus Christ, fasting and prayer was the way he made all his decisions. And so before he chose his disciples, he fasted and he prayed all night long. And as wise as he was, <clears throat> and under the leading of the Holy Spirit, the best he could come up with was a bunch of fishermen. <laughs> Think about that. After he had prayed, as wise and all wise as he was, under the power of the Holy Ghost, the best he could do was a bunch of fishermen. He, 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 he did not choose pedigreed priests. He, he did not choose thrilling theologians. He did not choose revered rabbis or sanctimonious Sanhedrin members. He bypassed them all. He passed the temple, went down, and chose fishermen. Ordinary people. Ordinary people. God always chooses ordinary people. All through scripture, comb scripture, he chooses ordinary people to do his work. Why did God choose the people that he chose? Why, why, why? Why did he, why did he pick you? Do you know that God chose you? Do you think about it. Of all the people in your town, in your city, in your village, in your family, Somehow God bypassed a whole bunch of people and he picked you. Not because you were special, by the way. But he picked you for a particular reason. If you want to know the reason, I'll tell it to you now. Because the reason is contained for us in the book of John chapter 15 and verse 16. Here's the reason. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. That's it. That's why he chose you. For some reason, he had the idea that you would be productive. For some reason, he thought that the others may not, but, but, but there's something about you, he says, would be productive. Understand that everything God created, he created it 
to reproduce and to do so profusely. The stars make more stars. Everything, the bees, the ants, the birds, everybody's busy reproducing, reproducing. That's, that is the genus and thesis of all of creation. Reproduce, reproduce, make more, make more. And when it comes to the most important of all organizations, the kingdom of God, he certainly wants it to be proliferous. He wants it to be innumerable. And so he picked people, he chose them for their capacity to be able to reproduce. And among them are us. If you want to evaluate yourself as a Christian, don't do so because you know scripture. If you want to evaluate yourself as a Christian, don't do so because somehow you have all the flowing gifts. If you want to evaluate yourself as a Christian, evaluate yourself in that you bear fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit in this proving to be disciples. That's the idea. That's why we are doing what we are doing right now with our Who's Your One campaign. When Jesus found a tree that wasn't bearing fruit, he cursed it. There's a reason why he did that. No one wants to be barren. People go through all kinds of therapies to avert barrenness. But spiritually, when it matters most, we cannot afford to be barren. And so the very first disciple was a man called Andrew. Andrew was ordinary. Point number one, his protocletus. Big word, but in theology... Andrew is called the Protocletus, and it means the first call. Proto meaning first, and Cletus meaning call. The narrative of the life of Jesus is covered by four gospel writers called the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of them covered the narrative of the life of Christ in a different way. Each spun the narrative to prove his respective Thesis. So therefore, if you're going through the Synoptic Gospels to try to come up with a perfect chronology, you're making a mistake. And that's how theologians get confused from day one. Because some of the chronology and the narratives conflict with one another. Not in truth and essence, but in the fact that the writers are lifting from the, narrative, from the narrative, the aspect of it that somehow uh, promulgates their thesis. Matthew wrote to prove that Jesus Christ was king. <clears throat> Mark wrote to prove that he was a servant. Luke, that he was a son of man. So Luke wants you to know that he was a human. And he tried to uplift all the things that had to do with the humanity of Jesus Christ. John wrote to prove in all his books to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. And therefore, certain narratives that were not covered by the other books are covered by John. John is the only one that says that Andrew followed Jesus Christ first. Everybody else has Andrew being called at sea. And there is the conflict. When was he called? We'll talk about that in just, just a while. And so John is the only one that begins with the story of Andrew following Jesus Christ first. As a matter of fact, he's the only one who begins his dialogue or who covers the birth of John the Baptist. He goes into the whole detail of John the Baptist. The others did not even mention that. Why? Because in the first place, Andrew was the first person to say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's why he covered Andrew. And John was also... The, well, actually, John was the first person to say that Jesus was the Son of God. Andrew would be the second. So he covers that because both people prove his thesis from day one. So in John chapter 1 and verse 19, he records for us the first event. John has a ministry in which he's baptizing people, and lots of people come to John at the Jordan River. 
lots and lots of people. And, and that day, Jesus came and he was in the midst. But the same time that Jesus came for the first day, in the midst of John, so came the religious authorities from Jerusalem. A big entourage of religious leaders have come to determine whether John is the Christ, the Son of God. And so they are coming to where Jesus Christ is in Galilee, and they begin to interrogate John the Baptist. And John answers them. He denies that he is the Christ. Let's go to verse 26 of John 1. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you who you do not know. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. So John did not single out Jesus Christ, but he mentioned that he is in their midst. And when he said that, you would think that for a generation of people who were all looking for the Messiah, including Herod and all, there was this, this idea that the Messiah was born about that time. And so they are aggressively looking for the Messiah. And you would think that when John says that he is right there right now, that everybody would be looking, but they did not. They were not too excited. They were more excited about John. John says, I am not even worthy to unloose the, the lace of his shoes. What is he saying? When you went to people's house, usually they would do foot washing because the roads were not paved, they were dusty. And so there were slaves who would wash your feet. But the lowest ranking slave was the one who would take your shoes off. And John is saying, I am not even qualified to be the lowest ranking slave to touch the list of his shoes. That's how much he is above me. John is saying, I'm, I'm ordinary. I'm not all that. I'm ordinary. So John says in verse 34, clearly he says, this is the son of God. Nobody follows. Nobody knows or asks who he was. So the following day, he sees Jesus coming and he points out again. He points out again. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's the second day. Nobody followed him. He points him this time. Nobody follows him. Not even Andrew. And then, that's why it comes to our text now in John 1.35. That's why you read again the next day. In other words, the next, next day. That's what he's saying. The third day. Jesus has come three times consecutively. This is not the third time. Read, let's read that in John 1.35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the, the, the Lamb of God... Two, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He's singled out. And he's always, always going to be called Simon Peter's brother. It is only on the third day. But John realized this was the Messiah. Why? Because point number two, his perceptivity. John was very perceptive. John was perceptive. John, John reminds me of, of my brother at the back, Leo. Leo is very smart. If I have a problem, and my wife knows the same thing. She'd always tell me, call Kevin. We call him Kevin. Call Kevin. 
Kevin don't talk much. He won't ever push himself. As a matter of fact, at our mother's function was the first time he sang a solo in his life. It's perceptive. And I've always known if there's one person I want at my side in anything I go through, it's him right there. Smart, perceptive. Never jumps like I would. No, sir. He's going to study you, study you first. He won't read you all the way. He won't say a thing. You will never know he's there because he won't make a scene. That was Andrew. Perceptive. Andrew believed Jesus to be Messiah when John's disciples did not. John had a large following. None of them left. They stayed with John. As a matter of fact, they had a beef with Jesus' disciples. Look at, look at John 3.26. They had an issue with Jesus' disciples. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the man, that's what they call him, the man who was with you across the Jordan, about whom you bore witness. See, this one is baptizing, and all are going to him. They had a problem with that. John told them he was Messiah. They did not even call him rabbi. They said, the dude that you witnessed about, you pointed out, everybody's going to him. John says, I must decrease. He must increase. They still did not go. John himself was never jealous. He replied to them, You yourself bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. But in the second place, Andrew believed Jesus to be the Messiah when even John himself wobbled. <clears throat> you see, John is an ordinary folk like us. And every now and then under the weight of trial, under the intensity of tribulation, we might wobble. We might waver a little. God can handle that. God can handle that. You may question God in the midst of your pain. You may say some things that you should not have said. God can handle that. John the Baptist, the one of whom Christ says, of men born of woman, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. He wavered. When the pressure hit and he was put in jail, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus Christ, man, is you the man or is, is it somebody else? What am I doing in jail if you are the Christ? Why am I in the situation that I am in if you are all that? Do, do, do you remember somebody else who asked that question? If you are for us, Gideon, then why are all these things happening to us? If you say you're for us, every now and then you'll go through circumstances and situations in your life in which you feel you have the right to be delivered by God on demand, but he does not. Then we must submit to his lordship. Here's what it says in Matthew 11, 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he heard the works. He sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come, or should we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you hear and see, the blind, Receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in me. He rebuked him. He says you should know. That the book of Isaiah 11. Chapter 11 and verse 2. Clearly states. That the, 
the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal all those things that I am doing confirms to you that I am the Messiah. But you're offended because I'm not helping you. Have, you. have you ever been there in your life? Have God ever offended you? He has me. In a few times in my life, when I, as a preacher of the gospel, an ambassador of Christ, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, open my big mouth and tell people it's going to be so and so, but it was not God's will for me to say that. I was presumptuous. And then God did not deliver on my demand. I got mad. I got mad. I'm in good position. I'm in good. I'm in among good people because John himself. And Christ says, blessed is he who is not offended in me. If you ever find yourself being uncertain under pressure. It's okay. It's okay. You are in good company. It just means you are ordinary. They have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Ordinary. Everybody gets it. You're just getting your share. But God is faithful. Who will not give you more than you are able to bear. So I say to you, if you are going through it, you can bear it. Because he said he would not give you more than you can bear. So if he's giving it to you, it means what? He said, I'm not going to give it to you if you cannot bear it. So if he's giving it to me, it means what? I can bear it. I will bear it. But also, Andrew believed Jesus to be Messiah because he himself spent time with Jesus Christ. When Andrew ask Christ, where do you live? And he says, come and, come and see. And that was not the call of Andrew. Andrew was not called then. That's the mistake people make. That's the mistake made in the Protoclesis also, or, or the Protocletus. Protoclesis is a whole other thing. Um, the Protocletus. That's the mistake they make. That was not the call of Andrew. And that's why people are confused. Well, how can he be called there? And he was called out. See, he was not called there. Nobody chose Jesus. Jesus chose everybody. Andrew did not decide anything. Jesus, what Andrew did was Andrew heard the testimony of John the Baptist. But because Andrew is investigatory in nature, and because Andrew is perceptive in nature, Andrew decided to find out for himself. So Andrew spent the whole afternoon into the evening at the feet of Jesus to determine whether what John said was true. And he found out by sitting at the feet of Jesus that he was in fact the Messiah. You see, Andrew chose the good part. You remember Mary and Martha? M Martha, Martha, Martha was busy. Busy, 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 busy body. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Andrew spent the rest of the day with Christ. And he determined when he left that place, as a matter of fact, when he asked Christ, where do you dwell? Christ did not give him the GPS to a house. He just said, come and see. I don't know what he saw. I don't know what he saw. But I'm sure he didn't see a bungalow. Foxes have holes. He said, the birds of the air have nests, but the man who made them all does not have a place to lay. Oh, come on, Jesus. Discipleship is tough. It's tough stuff. So when Andrew came, he saw tough. He went back fishing. Not that he... That was a bad thing. He was not called. Christ hadn't called him. You don't go to a rabbi. A rabbi comes to you 
And Christ had not made his selection of Andrew yet. Let's talk about the personality of Andrew. Personality. I wish that the whole church was full of Andrews. Lots of people covet the pulpit. But the growth of the kingdom takes place in the pew. Please understand that. The growth of the kingdom takes place in the pew. No matter how many mega church evangelists you see in America, they are not growing the kingdom. The kingdom is grown in the pew. You are his workmanship. And it's not grown at the pulpit with a microphone. It is grown when your feet hit the road. His personality. The Bible says in John 1 41. He first found his own brother. I like the way the Bible, but his own brother. Simon. And said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is, in, which, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas which is translated a stone. Guys looked at him and says, Wow! Rock man! That, that, that should have been irritating to Andrew because he never made any such proclamation about Andrew. He said nothing about poor old Andrew. All through scripture, every time you see Andrew, you see Andrew, son, uh, brother of Simon Peter. He's always in the shadow of his brother. But it doesn't bother him. Andrew was a servant at heart. Servants. Disciples are servants. The people who build the kingdom of God are supposed to be servants. Christ died and before he died he washed their feet. And he told them I want you to be the servant. If you want to be first, you must be the servant of all. When the church begins to operate from the perspective of servanthood, we serve one another, we love one another, we prefer one another, God's church will grow automatically. Do you understand that? My wife said it at the summit. We don't love as much as we think we love. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, and you love one another. So, so, so he was a servant. According to the Hebrew law of protogenesis, of firstborn, Andrew was supposed to be the priest. Andrew should have been the pastor. Andrew should have been the one who was the family leader. Andrew was supposed to be the one who had the double portion. And instead it goes to, to Peter. And Andrew does not care. You know why Andrew doesn't care? Because all he wants is Jesus. He, he, you can, he, he just wants Jesus. Of all the disciples, Andrew was the one besides John. Andrew and John. It is no surprise that it was the two of them who followed first. Andrew and John were the ones who were closest to Jesus Christ. Andrew's attitude was opposite that of Peter, James, and John, who were squabbling over who would be first in the kingdom. Andrew was never part of the squabble. You never saw his name involved in those sort of uh, preferential prerogatives. He never coveted the place of honor. He seems more concerned with serving and building the kingdom than his own reputation. I wish all churches filled with Andrews. Andrew is, was the evangelist of the group. He was always finding people and bringing to Jesus. The reason why many of us are not manifesting our discipleness, which is characteristically our productivity is our Christianity. 
the reason why may be that we are not excited about Jesus Christ as we think. We may be more like the disciples of John than Andrew. Andrew was excited. He was excited. He ran and got his breath, always bringing people to Christ. Secondly, he was supportive. He was a supportive person. Although he was Protocletus, Andrew was not part of Jesus' executive committee. He didn't make the committee. Christ had a committee. That internal executive committee was Peter, James, and John. Those three, he took on the Mount of come on, come on. He took them on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he didn't take Andrew. But Andrew was number one. He was the first one. Long before Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ actually says, Upon this rock I'll build my church. Andrew said it a long time ago. Long time ago. But Andrew was supportive. He wasn't there for position. Andrew wrote no epistle. He founded no church. He pastored no church. And was not a charismatic centerpiece in the apostolic age that followed. Andrew was just an ordinary person. The people who grow the kingdom of God are ordinary people. Ordinary people. We have inverted God's model. And we have come into a paradigm in which the workforce become attendees. The workforce comes to see the show and it becomes almost entertainment on TV. That there's a huge stadium filled with thousands of people and everybody is just there to see the man. You know what that was? That was John the Baptist kind of ministry. Everybody came just to see the man. But Jesus Christ put people to work we are his workmanship. Andrew exemplifies humble workmanship, not eye service. But Andrew was not weak. Andrew was very strong. Andrew was not soft. He was meek. In a culture where names bespoke character, the name Andrew says it all. The name Andrew comes from the word andros, which means man. And back then, they gave you a name that fit your character. It means that Andrew was very masculine, manly, brave. He was a man of valor. Not weak at all. He and Peter came from the same stock. He was not weak. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew was, was strong. He was tough, decisive, strong individual. But let's look at his profession. Andrew was a fisherman from Bethsaida. And as you know, the word Beth means house. So Bethlehem means house of bread. Lachem, bread, house of bread. Bethsaida, house of fish. If you live in Bethlehem, you probably have a bakery. That's what people are known for. But if you live in Bethsaida, everybody fished. That's what they did. They fished. Andrew was a fisherman. And on any given day, researchers say that there would be about 300 boats on that sea on any given day. And Jesus only chose, that, 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 he only chose a few of the fishermen who were there. But Andrew, he, he was a fisherman from Bethsaida. He, he knew how to catch fish. But secondly, he was a disciple of John also. As we have seen, Andrew uh, had given up. Oh, here's, here's a chronology. So Andrew, Andrew, when John said, this is the Christ, Andrew went after Christ. He determined it was the Christ. But, but, but Andrew went back fishing until Christ called him. Especially after John died, John's disciples disbanded. Andrew went back fishing as all the others did. 
And then Christ, at a future point, came and he called Andrew, who he had already had a relationship with. So the critics are wrong when they think that there's this confusion in Scripture. It's not. The writers of the Gospels did not give right to establish chronology of event. They lifted events that supported their thesis. Andrew didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose Andrew. He chose Andrew. Andrew also, let's look at his problem solving. His problem solving. He was a problem solver, like my brother is. Problem solver. He, he pretty much has an answer, a pretty good answer for everything. And when he gives you the answer, just, just go ahead. Don't even research. Just take the answer. Because if you waste your time researching, you're still going to come back to do what he says. Because if he opens his mouth, he's not like Peter. Peter just mouths out, not Andrew. When Andrew speaks, it means he researched already. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew was a problem solver. There was a time that there was 5,000 men following Christ. When you add women and children, it would exceed 7,000 people. They were far from... Uh, uh, they were in a desert area and there was no shops anyway. And so Jesus wanted to feed the people. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mount and very important. And there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover was a feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes. And seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. It is clear that Jesus knows that he is going to perform a miracle to feed the approximately 7,000 people. But he was inviting Philip. You see, God knows what he's going to do. He knows how to take care of your situation. But often he invites you into the process because he needs some faith to start with. Somebody must ex exercise faith at the human level for him to do a miracle at the spiritual level. So he goes to Philip first. You see, Philip is the pragmatist of the group. He is the placeholder of the group. Philip is the one who knows all the statistics. Philip is the administrator and the accountant of the group. Phil Philip is the realist. He's the realist. So Jesus Christ, oh, please understand that. Christ knew. It's just like when he was getting ready to turn the water into wine. He knew what he was going to do before Mary even opened her mouth. He knows what he's going to do. But he needed somebody to give him something to work with. So he says, take the water pots and pour them in your pitcher. He needed the faith. Somebody had to believe him enough to take plain water and pour it in a golden goblet and expect water to come out. He will do the miracle, but you must provide some kind of faith. Do you understand that? So he's getting ready to do a miracle, and he is going to the realist and the pragmatist First, why does he do that? Because he wants everyone to listen to the disposition of Philip. To listen to the conclusion of Philip. Philip says, Master, with all these people here, even if we had amount of money of the labor of a man for eight months, which we don't have, by the way. Even if we had all that money, <coughs> we would not be able to give everybody one bite. Philip is saying, what you are asking is impossible. 
And often God won't budge until. Because God wanted somebody to establish it can't be done. Are you with me? Pay attention in your life. That there will be many Philips in your life. Pay attention to that. Pay attention that there will be people who will speak a word. Against faith. But Andrew, who knew Jesus, because he studied Jesus, he knew something was getting ready to happen. He knew full well. So Andrew paid attention. Andrew had already noticed in all 7,000 people a boy had five barley loaves. He didn't just say five loaves. He called its name. He said the boy had five barley loaves. He knew the amount. He knew the type. And two fish. He gives that to Jesus. Andrew says, but what is this among so many? Why do you say that? He's saying, master, I'm going to give you five loaves and two fish, and I know it's nothing. I know it's nothing. But that's all Jesus needs. Your faith. You are nothing. I am nothing. But when you give him a mustard seed faith, Andrew says, I know, I know full well. Realism tells me it can't happen. Pragmatism tells me it can't happen. Faith speaks a different story altogether. He says, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to put it in your hands. Woo! And guess what? Jesus took it. He multiplied it. Andrew, Andrew knew what Jesus would do. But lastly, Andrew was prophetic. Let's look at his prophetism. Andrew, Andrew, that same Sabbath period of time, something unique happened. You remember one time when there was a woman of Cana, of Canaan, sorry, not Cana, Canaan, a Canaanitish woman, came to Jesus one time and told him, my daughter has a demon. Would you kindly help me by casting it out? Jesus says, I cannot take the food of the children and give it to the dog. What strong words. That woman says, Lord, the dogs. I don't mind being a dog. Jesus saw her faith and he rewarded her faith, but Jesus had told them when he sent the 70, he says, only go to the household of Israel. You remember, you remember that? They don't go to no Gentiles. Then he sent the 12, same instructions. Only go to the household of Israel. But as he progressed in his ministry, there are a bunch of Gentiles who want to see him at Passover, at high Jew time. This is the highest feast now. Ain't no time for, they want to see Jesus. They don't go to Peter because Peter had a little issue with prejudice. Paul had to put him in his place. They bypassed Peter who was supposed to be in charge. Guess who they go to? Philip. <laughs> the same thing. Who? And so, look at John. John 12, 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks, Gentiles. So these came to Philip the pragmatist who was from Bethsaida. They came to Philip because Philip had a Greek name. Because Philip had a Greek name, it suggests that he may have had Greeks or Gentile in his lineage. And, and, and so they came to him saying, hook up a brother, man. Hey, Philip, hook us up, man. Hook up the brothers. And Philip would not. Philip 
said, I, I don't think I should, but let me talk to Andrew. If anybody knows, it'll be Andrew. He calls Andrew. Do you know what Andrew does? Andrew does not send them away. Andrew could read that Christ had already begun to turn his attitude and attention to the Gentiles. He knew it was time. He knew very soon Christ was going to go to, 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 to Samaria anyway. He could tell. And Andrew took them to meet Jesus Christ. He understood the time. Andrew understood the time. Once Jesus was standing and looking at the temple in the distance, the graphic on the PowerPoint slide is just suggestive as to what could have been at that time. And while he was there, the Bible said, Andrew, and it's in, it's in Mark chapter 13 and verse 4, Andrew and a few others with him went to Jesus Christ and they asked him, Master, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when these things will be fulfilled? Andrew was a prophetic people. He wanted to understand end times. He wanted to understand what was happening. Andrew wanted to be relevant in his time. Sometimes the children of God are not relative in their own time. The gospel does not change. It never changes. But there's so many things that must change in the way we deliver it. And Andrew understood the times. He wanted to understand the times. In my conclusion, Andrew never thought, sought privilege or position. He just sought Jesus. He was an ordinary man and he knew his place. Not in the head of the pack but at the feet of Jesus all the time. He knew he was ordinary. But he also knew that Jesus was extraordinary. There are a whole lot of Andrews in the crowds today. Andrews and Andreas looking at me today. You may not have many of the gifts that would allow you to be singled out at the front for leadership. Oh, but you love Jesus. You spend time at the feet of Jesus. And you are the ones who can grow exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church. And I am counting on you, and we are counting on you to catch the Andrew effect. Get the Andrew effect. I was the first person in my entire family to come to Christ. That was, that, that was it, the first one. And I thank God for that. All my brothers and sisters now know Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. There is not one. And if you were at our function, you would have heard, heard me speak to them. Every time we meet, they get a sermon. Because I tell them this is a family of faith. No atheist is in the ranks of this family. Everybody is faith. Faith is what keeps us together. And when we went to the, to the repast on the grass over there, you know what we did for almost an hour? Put oil on people and prayed. Because there are lots of brothers and sisters and their families, and one by one, they just came, pray. I got two pastors helping me, Zell, Pastor Zell and Rennie. And we laid hands, and they just kept coming, and they kept coming. And we just pray, and we just pray. That's good. In a while, we're going to have a baby dedication. I want all of us to see ourselves as kingdom resources. Every one of us. See yourself as the person who needs to grow the kingdom. You've got to be productive. You cannot not be productive. That's why he called you. So first thing you do, look in your family. Are there people, are there brothers and sisters who don't know Christ? That's your job. You, you, you're going to say, but pastor, some of them have PhDs. I don't care. But they don't have faith. That's their job. They can't die and go to hell. God saved you to save them. All of you. Go all the way down to your, to your, to your, your second cousin level. All of them. 
get a get a, gen, a genogram and find out who is not saved. Go after them. P put them all in the family. All of us begin there. And then tell yourself, it is my job. Everybody repeat after me, please. It is my job to grow the kingdom. Repeat after me. It is my job to grow the church. Hallelujah. It is not the pastor's job. It's, it's my job. That's why you were saved. All of us. If there are empty pews, it is because of you. All of us. Don't, all of us have to bear that responsibility. God calls ordinary people. He likes to do that. He likes to do that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, my last scripture. Here's what the Bible says. For consider your calling. Brothers, consider it. Your calling when he called you. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. But he called you. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human might boast in his presence. And because of him, you are, you, because, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen to me, I know I am nobody. He will tell you I was nobody. I know my ranking in my class, number 26. I didn't really care about academic stuff. I didn't care if I flunked. I did. Why are you guys laughing at number 26? Yeah, I was 26 in a class of close to 26. I didn't care. It, I just knew that they were smart. I was not. Forget it. We can hardly wait for class to be over so we go fight. I mean, that's what we did. At, 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 at Kevin knows that. That's what we did. You know, right in front of the bathroom is a grassy area. That's where the boys who want to fight meet, and we just wrestle the whole time. I come home, my shirt's always torn up. I was just a nobody. Give me my slingshot. I would be looking after birth. I could care less. I was just, I, I was not smart. I knew it. But you know what? God called me. And when he did, he made me smart. He made me, I graduated the first in college. Not just Mark McConaughey, the number one highest student. That was not me. I know it wasn't me. I know it wasn't me. Lord knows it wasn't me. I went to my other degree, same thing. God gave me what I needed so I can do his work. He makes me write books. And yes, we're going to do that PhD. We're going to finish that PhD. <laughs> Brother Nolan, the camera is right there. We're going to help one another stay and do it just for the glory of God so we get it done. Listen to me. Folks, God didn't call. The kingdom of God is dependent on ordinary people. You're not going to see God trying to get some, some, some great politician to, to advance the kingdom of God. He passed them on his way to your house. Do you understand that, people? He passed them. You he looked for. He passed a whole but. Get excited about that. Get excited about the fact that God passed up a whole bunch of people who could talk better than you. There were a whole bunch of people who were better than Moses at oratory delivery of speech. The boy could not even talk. He was stuttering. And God said, I want you anyway. With all of your problems, I want you. What and all, I want you. I'll be with your mouth. Ordinary people, ordinary people. You think Mary was all that? She was a peasant girl. She was never Miss Nazareth, Miss Bethlehem. 
Now, nobody knew this little girl. She was nobody. God chose her and made her the most important woman on the face of this earth. Ordinary people. God is looking for ordinary people. He's looking for you. It was, a, it was an honor and a privilege for him to call you. Jeremiah was not anybody special. He says, ah, Lord. Ah, I'm just a little boy. Let me go play marbles, man. I'm just a little boy. Let me go play my top. God said, no, I called you. Gideon was nobody. He said it. He says, I am the weakest. My clan is the weakest and my tribe is the smallest. And I am the least in my father's house. Good, God says. I want you then. You think that David was all that? When the, when the prophet came to anoint the next king, David was not, he didn't even make the lineup. Daddy didn't even go get David. He left him in the bush. And he lined up the other boys with all of the pedigree of being fighters. Prophet went, here he is. God says, no. Prophet says, here he is. God said, no. Prophet said, here is. God said, no. Prophet said, here is. God said, no. Prophet said, what's up? Is that all of your kids? No, we, we, got, we got, there's a runt. Where's the runt? Where's the runt? Oh, this, bo this boy is always in the woods, man. <laughs> Go get him. Yes. God says, that's a man. After my own heart. People ever pass you up because you were ordinary? Go back to your class yearbook and look at all the people God passed up. The highest person in the whole universe passed up a lot of people. To get to your house. You better, you, 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 you better respect that. You, you better be joyous about that. You better honor that. That God chose you to grow the kingdom. We have work to do. All of us, we got work to do. The Andrew effect. We got to grow the kingdom of God. Father, bless your children. We know that we are just ordinary people. A few of us may have ascended the ranks in education and profession. And yet, even they will tell you that they were not born of noble birth. They too were just ordinary people. That's who you chose. And I thank you for that. Every day of my life, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Can the church say thank you? Thank you, Lord, that you didn't pass me up. Thank you, Lord, that your eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth to make yourself strong on the behalf of somebody. Thank you. You stopped by me. Give me a chance. I don't want to let you down. I'm going to be productive for you. I'm going to be productive for you. I'm going to be productive for you. Even today, someone, someone in the midst may be grappling with your own insignificance, and yet the conviction of the Holy Ghost is upon you to tell you God wants you, just like you are. What and all he wants you. With all of your sordid history, he wants you. Maybe today is the day that you will say, I accept the call of God for my life for salvation. Would you choose Jesus Christ today? Would you? Simply come to the front and say, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my Lord. If you're online, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord. 
I say yes to Jesus. Type whatever you want to type. Behold, I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up, I will come in and I'll stop with him. I'm calling you right now. God, he called me. Help me. All of my baggage, he helped me. I thank him for that. Let's just stand if you would. Come on, do a different song. I want to do your will, oh Lord. I want to do your will, oh Lord. Make me, take me, break me. Fill me and use me. I want to do your way. Oh Lord. You know that song? I want to do your way. Oh Lord. I want to do.
and I thank you. I pray, my God, that you will, you will, you will protect your children against this pandemic. I pray, my God, in this time of of inflation that is at this point beginning to suggest that there is going to be some hard times. I pray, my God, that you protect your children through it all. We do not worry about this. We are children of the kingdom, and we know that your kingdom has no end and that all things will turn out right for us. Therefore, we come to you in faith, thanking you for whatever happens in our life. We submit to you in every way. We thank you and we honor you. Let God's people say, Amen. Let God's people say, Amen. Don't, don't leave. We have not finished yet. Please take your seat for a second. I want to put a plug in for the picnic. The picnic. The picnic. We do want you to come and and bring amen thank you for dealing with her for me we do want you to come and bring bring someone do not come by yourself please bring someone with you bring some children so it's gonna be nice things are gonna happen if you have the 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 the, the, the uh, owner of the, the fish company southeastern fishing tackle uh, she has accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior and I thank God so much pray for her pray for her Pray for her. It was it was just classic the way the Lord did that. She being a Muslim, having been a Muslim, and they are very hard to convert, and the Lord did that. She is wants to be wants to be grateful. She was, she's gonna bring a big tank, and they're gonna fill it with live fish, and the kids are gonna be taught how to fish real fish. And that would be cool. That's gonna be cool. It's one of the first things that would happen. All right, and so kids are gonna have a great time. There's going to be um, um, pickleball play and basketball play and four square volleyball play and all kinds of fun. And that's what it means to have community. We are all going to love on one another. And as they pass by, they're going to see us having community. Beautiful. And they're going to want a piece of that as we love on one another. Please bring a guest. I've invited my neighbor. I said, bring your grandkids. And he is coming. He's my one. Bring your one. Right, John? Your one are invited. Um, so, I'm going to ask if the family for the dedication would kindly come up. Bryce is already this big. What are you feeding these kids? Is what's up, Grandpa and Grandma? You want you want to stay down? Okay. In a while, I want you to be part of the picture. Okay. So we will step right down here so you can take take a picture. All right. Baby Bryce, you guys are gonna stay that far too, huh? You can come. All right. You guys are supposed to be part of it because you are part of who's raising him, okay? So if you want to come up, you can. If, if it's difficult for you, don't. But come, all of you come up, all of you. Everybody come up. That's what's missing, the extended family. Through migration and gentrification, the extended family model breaks down. And now nobody wants to eat grandma's food anymore. Grandma can't even correct the kids because mom won't allow grandma to say anything to her children. Grandpa can't correct his own grandkids because the parents don't think grandpa knows anything. That's what's happening to us. The extended family is part of raising the child. All of you are raising the child. Amen? Hallelujah. Check it out. Look at us, look at us. This brother is just so shocked. Hallelujah. Amen. And 
all of you are going to answer. All of you are going to answer. Do you promise to raise Bryce to know, honor, and serve God and seek his kingdom above all else? Hallelujah. Do you promise to help Bryce develop strong faith and protect him from worldliness and harmful human ideology? Hallelujah. Do you promise to teach Bryce how to love God with all of his heart and to love his fellow men as himself? Do you promise to give Bryce adventure and fun and laughter and joy and help him to become resilient in the good times and in the bad times? Hallelujah. Having said that and having pledged to do so, because children don't belong to you. That is a Gentile concept. When a child is born, the child is dedicated. And in the dedication, the parents pay a sacrifice to get the child back. Do you understand that? That's what it is. The child is not yours. And so you are saying, God, I'm going to give a sacrifice. I want to give you back the child. And so, especially the firstborn child. But all children are the heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Therefore, it is good that a man has his quiver full. I'm expecting lots more children. Ah, oh, come. I set this thing up so nicely. And she says, no. <laughs> oh, man. In the extended family model, it's not your decision. It's whatever they say. What do you say, Small? What do you think, Smalley? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, there, there is enough food. We'll, we'll, we'll cook falafel and all that good stuff. <laughs> He's laughing. Hallelujah. Uh, Dick, bring the oil for me. Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Give me a nice name with a little good boy. Okay. Yeah. Strong boy. Beautiful. Come on, pray for him. It's okay. Stay right here. Don't stay? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to pray for Bryce right now. Let's pray for him. As a matter of fact, everybody put a hand on him. Put a hand on Bryce. Father, when life ends, as I have experienced with my mother, only thing that matters are your children. No one else gathers the children. When life begins, similarly, it's the family. These people are now in Bryce's life to make sure that faith is promulgated and propagated and preserved in their lineage. Help them to guard the boy. Help them to do all that they have pledged to do and more. To teach him to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. To help him when he becomes of age to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. To be obedient in baptism. And to serve the Lord faithfully. Be guarded against some of the foolish things that are happening right now with black young men. Preserve the boy. I pray. I pray, my God, even as you said that, that Jeremiah had the Holy Ghost from his birth. Not that he was indwelt, but that the Holy Ghost was put upon him from a child. Oh, I pray, my God, that this one would be preserved against the day that he would trust you. Fill him with gifts. Fill him with talents. Make him extraordinary because he is yours. Bring finances and wealth 
to him and through him to the family. Let him be a great reward to your kingdom and a great reward to his parents. Bless the child, we pray, as he adds to the life of the church and to the life of the kingdom of God. Bless him, I pray. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. And so, let me say now to you, there's a gift from um, our deacon chair. He's going to present to the parents. And we thank you so much. Okay. I want to stay right here. Your turn, your, your job is to what? To support that family and to grow that family. All of you know my family. I want you to know my family. I want all of us to do the same. Introduce your whole family to the church. There should be all kinds of family reunions happening in the church. Make sure your family stays in the fold. Our job is to help them. Help them. And usually what I do is I ask for a person from the church to be a central godparent. Is that okay with you? Somebody who will say, I want to be the person from central. Is there someone who says, I want to be there? Somebody? Hey, right here. Okay. Deacon Kenny said, I want to be there. I'll be that central person that will look out for your friends. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to do the doxology. From here because it's also a musical family and so we're going to do the doxology